Hey gang, David Shapiro here uh, with another video. Today we are going to talk about Web3 and blockchain. And I know that you uh, probably know me for talking about AI, so bear with me, I promise this is related to artificial intelligence. Um, but also I wanted to say my channel is presently growing exponentially, um, and a lot of you are reaching out to me on Patreon and LinkedIn, and um, I'm working with my team to figure out how to uh, handle this volume, so please be patient. Um, in the meantime, I'm also gonna be taking a bit of a vacation. I'll still be producing uh, video content because it's, uh, it, it's pretty easy for me, but I am uh, probably not gonna be responding to other messages. So uh, keep, keep the invitations coming and so on. Support me on Patreon if you'd like. Uh, but yeah, on with the show. <sighs> okay, everyone has heard of Bitcoin and Ethereum by now. You've probably also heard uh, Web3 and blockchain and cryptocurrency. So let's untangle this mess and figure out what these things are, what they're good for, and uh, what the problems are, and also where it's going. Okay, so first, what the heck is Web3? Um, there's a whole lot of energy around Web3. Um, and the, the, the simple version is that Web3 is the uh, is the arrival of blockchain and the deployment of blockchain technologies into uh, web. And so what is blockchain? It is a, dis uh, a, a distributed ledger technology. It is the underpinning technology of cryptocurrency um, and a lot of other decentralized uh, uh, ideas. So NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and DAOs, distributed autonomous organizations, these are all examples of Web3 technologies. Now, that being said, there are a lot of grifters. Um, you might have heard of SBF and FTX, the uh, biggest uh, collapse so far. Um, and so DeFi is part of the whole Web3 scheme. Um, so that's what it is in a nutshell. So why are there so many grifters? Uh, well, the first reason is there's a fool born every moment uh, or every minute. Um, people have always fallen for new fads and gimmicks and trends. And whenever there's a new gimmick or trend, uh, some people do make a lot of money, uh, but a lot of people lose their shirt. The reason is because it's the Wild West. There is no regulation yet. Uh, the governments are notoriously slow to respond. Um, and up until this point, the, the, the FEC or SEC and uh, other, other institutions have been taking a wait and see approach. Um, you know, a few years ago, they declared that cryptocurrency was just an asset, not a currency. And so they're like, okay, well, we'll just treat it like an asset. Um, but then, of course, um, all the uh, all the the financiers, they got in and they treated it more like a currency. And then we had the collapse of FTX. And so you can bet your bottom dollar that the regulators are coming. Uh, so beware of Ponzi schemes. And also, um, if someone says, do your due diligence, and they're trying to sell you something, that is gaslighting. Um, <laughs> if anyone is a Web3 or DeFi bro, and they say, do your due diligence, that's basically saying the onus is on you to check me. I'm not going to prove that I am legitimate. Um, so basically just walk away. Because uh, if you do your due diligence, you will realize that the technology and the governance are immature and therefore it is not safe. So that's where we are today. And you might say like, Dave, what the heck? Like you're always so optimistic and you're always so on board with these new technologies. I am and we will get there. But this, uh, the reason that I'm so critical right now is because the, the world needs to know how crazy this is and how vulnerable it is. But we also need to paint a picture of what's possible in the future so that we have the energy to do it right. Okay, so far, what is blockchain and Web3 actually good for? Uh, the short answer is nothing yet. There has not been a single large-scale successful project. Um, one that I was super excited about was the Australian Stock Exchange was working on moving to a blockchain-based clearing uh, mechanism. But that actually failed. They actually had to undo it. Um, I was so excited because if a, if a stock exchange was running on blockchain, that would, have, that would have proven, that would have been a pivotal moment to say that, yes, this technology is real, it's ready for for uh, for for showtime, but it's not, right? Uh, it was. It's too new. It's too experimental. There's so much to figure out. It's coming. Blockchain is not going anywhere, but it's not mature enough. 
So then you might say, okay, well, what about NFT marketplaces? Like, no, like, come on. Like that is, that is just like, Hey, let's, we, we, we already have, we already have microtransactions. Now let's slap blockchain on top of it and call it and, and just call it something else. Right? Like NFT marketplaces, I guarantee you were probably come up with by the gaming industry. So like, don't, don't just do microtransactions and call it something else. No, sorry. Um, cryptocurrency. Yeah. Uh, cryptocurrency has a lot of potential. Uh, it really resonates with people. I remember when I first discovered Bitcoin, when it was worth about five cents a coin. Boy, howdy, do I wish I had bought up on that. Um, you know, the idea is, oh, hey, here's here's a here's a, a, a reserve of value, right? Because that's what all currency is. It's a reserve of, of value. It's an abstraction of goods and services that is completely immutable and can't be stolen from your wallet unless, you know, someone steals your wallet. Um, so there is some appeal there, but... Uh, it hasn't caught on despite how popular it is. Uh, so is it good for pump and dump schemes? Absolutely. Um, I won't go into more detail, but if you know, you know. Um, so then, you know, okay, so Australian Stock Exchange, that was a legitimate attempt. Um, VMware Enterprise Blockchain, um, you know, my, my in a previous life, I was a VMware expert. So I went to VMware Explore and got to talk to their um, one of their uh, blockchain experts. Um, and so once you have these more mature uh, companies that are working on deploying these things and testing their robustness, then you know that you're going to get some corporate adoption and then uh, la a lagging indicator will be government adoption. So it's coming, right? Blockchain is coming, but it's not mature yet. Um, as far as I know, the VMware Enterprise blockchain is still in um, closed beta. I could be wrong about that. Okay, so blockchain versus cryptocurrency. This one drives me bonkers. If you say blockchain and someone starts talking about Bitcoin, like that makes me like not literally like enraged, but it's very frustrating. Okay, so cryptocurrency requires blockchain. You cannot have Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever else without an underlying blockchain. The blockchain is the distributed letter ledger. Now, you can have a blockchain without cryptocurrency, right? Uh, like the Australian Stock Exchange, using blockchain to record all the stock transactions. No cryptocurrency involved, right? So a blockchain is just a distributed ledger. Now, within that, blockchains can be public or private. So a public ledger, a distributed public ledger, is something that everyone can see. It's completely transparent. And a private ledger is something that only you know your company can see or that the government can see or the stock exchange or whatever. <clears throat> so what are the advantages of blockchain? It's a distributed ledger. Okay, what does that mean? It's basically a linear database that is public uh, or, or distributed uh, database. So, okay, that sounds overly simple. What is it good for? Well, there's a few primary advantages to having a distributed uh, ledger, whether it's public or private. One, it's tamper resistant because every transaction is recorded. You can't just delete something from the database from the from your blockchain and then have it be gone, right? The it, it's it's there, and then you can add another record where you say get rid of this other one. But everything is recorded, every transaction is recorded, and so therefore it is tamper resistant and Im immutable. Another thing is that um, it operates by consensus and is verifiable because this is there's a huge problem whenever you have any distributed uh, data or information or security thing, and this has all of it, right? It's distributed data, it's distributed um, uh, uh, computation, it's all distributed. And so therefore, you have to have all kinds of consensus mechanisms built in before a block is even added to the chain. And so this consensus mechanism is actually really, really critical. Because like I said, okay, you might say uh, distributed ledger, what's fancy about that? The, the, the consensus mechanisms, that is one of the coolest aspects of this, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, another benefit of blockchain is that you have a cryptographic chain of custody. Um, if you put something on a blockchain, it is recorded forever that you put it there. And anyone who accesses it, or downloads it, or modifies it, or whatever, that gets recorded. Um, and so by having that chain of custody, that, un that unlocks new uh, possibilities, which is why the idea of an NFT 
is like an initial idea and there there are better ways to do nfts we'll talk about that in just a second but another the, the one of the final main benefits of blockchain is that it is resilient and fault tolerant because it's distributed any one node can go offline um, and you're fine and also with the with the latest uh, enhancements um, particularly stuff that I learned about VMware's um, deployment of blockchain um, it's also it's also resilient against bad actors they assume that you could have up to 49% of the nodes as bad actors, right? Which means that it is also resilient against uh, malicious intent and not just, and it, well, that goes back to tamper resistant. So anyways, uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency, not the same thing. Make sure to separate those in your mind. Cryptocurrency is one thing. It requires blockchain, but blockchain is, uh, it, it, it has a much broader application. So cryptocurrency, small, blockchain, big. Hope that helps. Okay, so what does this do? Dream number one for Web3 and decentralization and cryptocurrency and blockchain, the original dream, and this is what I remember people talking about uh, in the early days of Bitcoin, is decentralized economy. It was a big F you to the government saying, ha, you can't control my money. I control my money. You can't even tax this. Once I have Bitcoin, you can't tax it. You don't even know that I have it. It's mine. And that's part of why it's called cryptocurrency. Crypto means hidden, hidden currency. Excuse me. <clears throat> Ugh, sorry, need some tea. That was pretty gross. Um, so anyways, it was the dream of getting away from the Federal Reserve and centrally uh, managed economies um, and getting away from fiat currency. So a fiat currency is, is a reserve of value that has value because some authority says so because the US federal government says the US dollar has value um, and that all the laws in place when, the, you know, when we got away from the gold standard said, this is a, a legitimate currency to settle all debts and transactions, blah, blah, blah. So it has value by fiat, right? By, by government fiat. Now, crypto's value is determined by market demand and exchange rates, uh, which is more like gold. Right, gold has value because everyone says so. The government doesn't set the value of gold. People set the value of gold. Likewise, people set the value of cryptocurrency. Um, now, uh, you can also have the value of, of uh, fiat currencies set relative to each other with exchange rates, but those exchange rates are often dictated by governments, right? Again, it's still fiat, whereas um, the exchange rates of crypto, that is set by the market. So government, market. Right. That is the that is the key difference in terms of these currencies, because otherwise you might say, OK, well, it's just an abstract value. Right. One Bitcoin is worth an arbitrary amount. One U.S. dollar is worth an arbitrary amount. Both of them change. Right. We have inflation. We have inflation and deflation in any kind of currency. Um, so but the dream here, though, is that because uh, because cryptocurrency uses a global blockchain, um, then you should be able to exchange goods and services across borders without taxes, without tariffs, without any interference, um, and without any tracking. And I, and I added the sort of about tracking because every transaction is recorded and your wallet uh, address is hypothetically um, uh, anonymous, right? And the reason that money was going in and out of your wallet is also not recorded. Um, at least... I. I don't, know, I don't know if that's still true. You might have like a note or something. Um, but it's, it's anonymous by virtue of the fact that your wallet is anonymous. But, uh, but if, that, if, the, if your wallet gets tied to your name, everything that you've ever done and everyone you've ever interacted with is recorded in a network. So it's private until it's not. Um, and that can be bad. Uh, so this is ideal for banks and businesses and black market enterprises. Um, I remember years ago, uh, there was a rumor circulating that the, uh, that the Japanese Yakuza actually had the greatest amount of Bitcoin um, and that they had like workshops doing pump and dump schemes all the time. Maybe, maybe that was true. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's still true. I don't know. Um, but I can imagine that banks would love this because then, you know, it's like, oh, hey, we can, we can, we can trade cryptocurrency. We can invest. We can... Um, we can do whatever we want to make more and then exchange it for US dollars and it's all completely hidden. Um, so because of all that, 
because it's, it's difficult to track, it's also really good for dodging regulations and taxes. So federal governments really don't like cryptocurrency. Uh, and so because of that, it's like, all right, well, you know, cryptocurrency is great, but the law of the land might say one thing and you might say another. So there's going to be a lot of clash. And if the federal government doesn't ever support cryptocurrency, it's going to remain unregulated and dangerous. But here's the other thing is it's very difficult to regulate something that is intrinsically decentralized. You can't stop the signal now. All right. So dream number two, free marketplaces. This is an extension of that first one of decentralized uh, economies. So this gives rise to the possibility of non-fungible tokens, which basically someone sat around and said, hey, what if we put digital assets on the blockchain and, and sell it there um, so that you can, you can artificially create scarcity? And I'm like, really? Really, that's the best you can do? This was definitely dreamed up by, uh, by gaming executives who wanted to figure out how to, um, <laughs> how, to, how to just like rebrand microtransactions. Um, now, that being said, I have I haven't done a full 180. I've done like a 120 on this, um, and that was because of the AI art backlash. So one possibility emerged, and that is okay. Well, everyone is uh, is upset about having their art being taken and used to train, um, you know, like Stable Diffusion and Dolly, and well, I guess Dolly they haven't done that, but Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey. And so it's like okay, well, what if we put all of our hard, hard, uh, hard created, uh, art, human created art on a blockchain technology, rather than just hosting it on deviant art or Reddit or imager or whatever, because then it's just a file, right? It's a JPEG, it's a PNG, it's a, you know, whatever file type that anyone can just download automatically. What if instead you put your art on a blockchain and therefore even and, and then and then for anyone to even see it, they have to request it from the blockchain, and that transaction is is metered, right? Um, and then then you as the artist, you always get credit every time someone even sees your your work of art, right? Every time someone even sees it or downloads it for whatever purpose, you get credit for it, and they have to pay for it somehow. So that's one one idea. And then if your if your art ends up in um, a, uh, a training database that is used to train, you know, another version of Stable Diffusion or some other AI art generator, then every time that that AI art generator gets used, because it's all on the blockchain, every time someone downloads it, you get a fraction of, of, of credit because your training data helped generate another billion images, right? So I think that, I think that the NFT idea I have not seen any compelling argument that NFTs are a good idea. Now, this other idea about tracking and controlling all online art, and I don't mean just um, just uh, images, right? This can be music. This can be uh, anything you write, right? So when you have chain of custody, if you write it, if you as a human write it, and it is cryptographically verified that you, with your hands, wrote it, you put it on a, on a blockchain, and then it's verified a human wrote this, right? So there's all kinds of possibilities of, of blockchain and the cryptographic chain of custodies so that you know who created it, when and how, right? And then you also know who accesses it. So we could create two like internets, right? Where there's one is the AI generated content and the other is the human generated content. This is just spitballing. This is a, a, a wild guess on my part. All right, dream number three. This is where it starts to get really abstract. So <clears throat> Ethereum back in, I think it was 2015 or 2016, one of the creators of Ethereum said that it's the world brain that can't be turned off. And that was like, nobody, like, I only recently heard it. I was like, what does that mean? So with, te uh, with technologies, with blockchains like Ethereum, you have this distributed uh, uh, network and each node does more than just record information or record transactions. Each node can execute smart contracts. And a smart contract is just a bit of computation, right? So because of that, Ethereum is a massively parallel network of intelligent nodes. Well, guess what else is a massively parallel network of intelligent nodes? The human brain. And so that's what they meant when they said that, that Ethereum is the world brain that can't be turned off. 
Because remember, a blockchain is also resilient. Any one node can go offline and the rest of the thing continues working. So cryptocurrency in this respect is, at least in part, just a way to reward people who are participating on this network, right? If you're, if you're running a node and, and you're performing computation for the network, you should get rewarded for that, right? Because you put up the hardware and you're doing, you're, you're doing computational work for the network. Now, alternatively, if you contribute valuable information uh, to the network, knowledge, data, information, you should also get rewarded for that every time it gets used. And so this leads to the idea, my primary assertion, we are thinking about AGI wrong. When we think of AGI, we still think of self-contained individual agents. But when you have a massively parallel network that can operate by consensus and is resilient and has the collective intelligence of everyone who's participating, that's going to be way more intelligent than any single computer system. So one thing that I, one goal that I want to have with this video is to get people to start thinking about um, AGI does not have to be remotely human in its intelligence. We can create a hive mind that is a hybrid of human intelligence and machine intelligence with technologies like blockchain. Okay, so that might be sounding a little bit sci-fi, right? If you're a Trekkie like me, then it's like, okay, the Borg, where it's like you've got this network hive mind of intelligence and it's all distributed and drones can be sacrificed. And that's not exactly what I'm proposing here. I'm not saying that we should all like use Neuralink and other brain implants to like, um, you know, slave ourselves to the Ethereum network. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but I do want to point out that we have intrinsically explored this idea through science fiction and not just with the Borg, but the idea that like we could become a hive mind or something like that, uh, or, or build something like that. It's intrinsically scary because then you lose your personhood. So that's not what we're proposing at all. So what are, what, what am I proposing? What are we talking about when we say, how do we use blockchain technology to revolutionize the world? So first is voting and democracy. We already have a nationwide consensus mechanism, and that's voting, that's representative democracy. Um, but it is slow and inefficient and sometimes unfair. It's also really old fashioned. Uh, America's voting system, like our, it's 200 years old, right? It's time for, an, for, time for an update. So we can strengthen voting and our representative democracy with these kinds of technologies. We can make voting easier, more reliable, more and more secure. And if you can make voting easier, more reliable, more secure, you can do it more often and more fairly. Um, and remember, what are the advantages of blockchain? It's secure, it's verifiable, it's immutable, it's transparent, it's, re it's resilient. That sounds ideal for democracy, right? We're not gonna, if, if we, managed to figure out this. And obviously, like if we couldn't figure it out for the Australian Stock Exchange yet, it's not ready. But in the future, one day, imagine that every decision, every opinion that you have, everything that you need, you get to vote on in a blockchain, probably in real time or near real time. Um, then like the collective willpower of the people is updated on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, rather than every year or every other year or every four years, right? So there's a tremendous amount of possibility here for overhauling the way that we come to consensus as a nation. Another possibility is for autonomous machine intelligence. Now, Ethereum is already kind of working towards that. Um, and so, but another thing to think about is, okay, if you have a distributed node of intelligent networks that operate by contracts, and then you all, then you by by definition you also have distributed control and reasoning, depending on the rules of that network. So if block or since blockchain war operates by consensus, therefore it's not going to do anything crazy, right? Unless everyone agrees that we should do this crazy thing. Um, the Geth from Mass Effect are a pretty good representation that almost got it right, right? You know, obviously for dramatic purpose it had to go horribly wrong, but when you uh, explore the lore of the Geth, there are distributed networked intelligence that operate by consensus, right? They, they figured that out back in like 2009 or whenever uh, the first Mass Effect came out, 2007. 
Um, so they, they came up with that like long before Ethereum. Um, so what if the objective function of our, uh, of our uh, blockchain, you know, our distributed hive mind is to find consensus, not force consensus, but f find it. And so remember that um, blockchain uh, immutable, transparent, resilient, consensus, this sounds really good. And it sounds like a really good way of avoiding like the Skynet catastrophe, right? Where you have one intelligent entity kind of operating on its own and it's not intrinsically connected to the rest of the world. But if it is, if it is a global lattice, if it is a global network and it can take in information from every, every human and take in different perspectives, different ideas and help to find consensus, that could be much more powerful and much safer. So the last thing that I want to say is to think global. Take a big step back. Don't just think about, you know, the finance industry or the shipping industry or your country or your city. Take a big step back and think how Web3 technologies, blockchain, cryptocurrency can, can help with creating global consensus. How can we do global distribution or redistribution? of wealth and value? How can we do global representation better? How can we do global democracy and safety better? And finally, what would it be like if we can create a global intelligence that operates by consensus? Um, and uh, I have a, uh, an interview that I did a few months back with the folks over at Tao. And the line that stuck with me was, your imagination is not good enough to know what it will be like if we succeed. Um, and Tao is one of the one of the, the few uh, companies that I believe is they're going they're going in this direction. Um, so thank you uh, for watching. Um, try and think bigger. All of this is within reach. Thanks for watching.